Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. Jack Munns. Dr. Munns has a decade's worth of experience in the field of plant molecular genetics, working on complex gene regulation and nutrient metabolism projects. He obtained a Bachelor of Science in Botany from Colorado State University while working as a lab assistant facilitating the development of genetic markers for invasive species. Jack then earned a Master of Science from Illinois State University where he worked towards increasing vegetable oils and temperate grasses like corn for biodiesel production using targeted gene expression. He then earned his PhD in botany from the University of British Columbia, during which he worked to unravel the genetic regulation of nitrogen starvation responses in plants with next-gen sequencing technologies. Dr. Muntz is a lead scientist at Genie Labs and head of pathogen testing, research, and development. Now on to the show. Hey, Jack, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, so uh, if you could give listeners a little background into uh, your your personal history and uh, Three, River, Three Rivers Biotech, uh, why don't we start there? Absolutely. Um, so my background is plant molecular genetics. Um, so I've been doing this for over 10 years now. I've worked on a number of projects. Um, I started working uh, to undergrad at Colorado State Botany and then went into uh, genetic projects working on biodiesel and genetic engineering of crops for, for biofuels. Um, so during that, just a wealth of, of genetic techniques that I learned. Um, finished my PhD at uh, University of British Columbia and then took on a job with Three Rivers Biotech to develop um, genetic diagnostic tools uh, for cannabis pathogens, um, pathogens in general, um, in addition to sort of genotyping of cultivars for sort of genetic identification purposes um, for our tissue culture programs. Um, So Three Rivers Biotech. So we've been operating now for a few years. Um, We have labs in Canada and Washington and California for tissue culture and for uh, testing. We have a lab in Washington um, just across the border from me. And then I'm uh, based out of uh, Canada myself, but um, I sort of guide and go down there and do testing for pathogens there. Uh, as far as what pathogens we test for, so the main one's hop latent viroid, but then we can also test for 11 other viruses. Um, most of those are generic viruses to to uh, just sort of broad, broad range um, uh, agriculture. Um, and then in addition to that, we do test for broad range fungal and bacterial Um, infections such as Pythium and Fusarium, Botrytis, sort of those really big, you know, the heavy hitters in the agriculture industry. Um, So yeah, we have a variety of different testing uh, that we have available for folks, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been very busy, Um, but that's sort of the, where we're at. And then as far as the tissue culture goes, um, we provide storage and cleanup of cultivars uh, and we've gotten the timelines really down to a shorter window so we're we're looking we can get plants back out in about three months best case scenario um, and the price has gone down substantially too because tissue culture is pretty expensive but um but we've gotten it to be more amenable to a market that is fast moving so um so that's great yeah now we've been working with you and offering your pathogen testing um for over a year now maybe like a year and a half, I would guess, uh, off the top of my head. And that's been going really well. Um, All the feedback we've gotten has been really positive. Um, And uh, a good friend of mine, Justin McGill, over at Mako Farms, is now doing some tissue culturing. We need to clean up some of his genetics while he does a quick farm reset here um, with the LCB. So I'm excited for that. And we're going to be able to offer those as well through KISS. So I'm I'm looking forward to being able to have those things available. And... um, yeah, let's just dive right into this podcast. So I do want to touch a little yeah. bit on some other uh, viruses that you do test for and some of your other testing protocols and what folks can look for. But the main point of this yep. 
this podcast was because uh, I recently attended that webinar that Dr. Uh, Punja put on, uh, Dr. Zamir Punja, who's doing uh, really the cutting edge research, it, it appears, on hoplite and viroid. Um, and he worked with you guys in, in conjunction with you guys on some of this with the testing. Can you talk about that relationship really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so early on, um, so I think it's like two and a half years ago, um, we connected with with Dr. Punja at a, at a conference here in uh, in British Columbia, an agricultural one that had a focus on some hemp and cannabis stuff that. Um, he has been working in the field of cannabis and hemp for a, a, a while now, mostly um, a lot of publications on, on fusarium and pythium, some of the, the botrytis, some of the, the fungal pathogens. Um, but when he's been out there in the field with growers, just saw sort of how, how widespread some of this hop latent viroid uh, might actually be. And so we started testing um, at a few big cultivations that he collaborates with and just, and just networks that he knows. Uh, to sort of see the extent of the problem a couple years ago. Um, and from there, it just sort of, you know, snowball downhill, um, took off as he realized that we know not enough about this viroid. We don't know how it spreads, don't know the stability. And so he took it and just ran with it. And so as far as the academic side goes, he's um, just <laughs> he's just a wonderful resource of knowledge. But as far as what we've done with him is... Um, you know, really high throughput, large screens to get a handle on on spread, which is challenging. Um, so within a big facility, how is it spreading? Um, and so getting some big numbers on, on that kind of thing, testing different parts of the plant. Um, so both working with, with Dr. Prunja and um, also a nursery in Oregon, um, we were basically looking at different parts of the plant to see where hop latent viroid actually um, is most prevalent and found that it is much, much higher in the roots than anywhere else in the plant. And so one of the main takeaways is just that testing leaves and stems is going to give you a lot of false negatives and testing roots is about four times more accurate. We're talking around 80, 85% of the time you can get to detect detect a positive in the roots, whereas you're only detecting positives in the leaves and stems about 25 to 30% of the time. So it's a big difference. Um, and particularly when you're talking about uh, a latent viroid and you're gonna have to do more than one test to really prove a negative, um, having only a 25 to 30% hit rate in a known infected plant is just way too low to really get you ahead of the viroid. Um, and so it's, you're always playing catch up. Um, so yeah, that's, one of the main aspects. Um, also then the spread, uh, we did water testing. So that's something I've been developing too, is, is being able to filter water systems um, and test viroid in circulating water systems. And so we did find that the hoplane viroid can be detected um, in, in recirculating water um, and that can lead to infections that are on that same flood table um, or anywhere in contact with that water. So a lot of interesting findings. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the root thing is, is relatively new in the last, what, year yeah. or so, would you say, that yes. that research has shown? And so if yeah. a grower suspects they may have hop latent viroid, um, wh what is the recommended sampling and testing protocol to really determine uh, infection? Right. Yeah, so we conducted those studies um, both here in Canada and in the States. It was uh, August, I think, is when a lot of that testing was done. And then we sort of released some of those findings in September-ish. So, yeah, it is relatively new. Um, and at this point, you know, it's strongly, you know, I always strongly recommend testing roots. Um, as far as testing protocols go, the type of root you need is not, you don't need like a, a central, um, a central thick root that's, that's coming off of the root crown. Like the fibrous roots around plant pots are great. Um, so small root samples are fine. Uh, as far as testing protocols go, um, if you're able to take a small snip from multiple parts around the plant, that can help. Um, because even with roots, there's still some false negatives where it's just not in the sample. Um, so like I said, it's about 80, 85% accurate. So we always recommend multiple tests. So Zamir, so Dr. Punja would recommend three negative tests in a row. Um, I understand the constraints of, of growers. So I always recommend a minimum of two and spread those out, you know, three to four weeks. Um, and spreading them out, what that does is if it is a latent infection, like it's a newer infection, a few weeks is time for that viral load, uh, 
to sort of increase to the point where it's easier to detect. Um, in the meantime, those plants, if you do suspect an infection, should be quarantined, uh, shouldn't be sharing water sources with other plants that you know are negative, um, and, and certainly not in production rooms um, until you know that they're negative. Otherwise, you could be spreading it without knowing. Um, so yeah, the, the testing protocols, small bits of roots from around the plant if possible, um, or you know, multiple tests, always multiple tests that are negative uh, to ensure that you're getting a negative um, and always roots. You know, there's just really no point in testing leaves and stems now. Um, and then the one other point that I mentioned is that I have some preliminary data in my lab. Um, young plants are also not a great place to test. So we took cuttings from positive moms rooted them and then tested every month and that first month in a positive cutting even the detection goes away for that first month and then it comes back two three months later so that right after cloning is a terrible time to test you want to test your old moms before you do your cuttings um, and teens when you're trying to select new moms teens before you up pot to big pots those are two critical moments that you can get a better representative sample of if they're positive or not well, that's important. And how much root mass do you need to actually uh, do a sample or a test? Right. Yeah, very little. So yeah, our testing, um, we're talking about a centimeter of fibrous roots. Um, so the actual mass, if you were to weigh it on a scale, um, about 100 milligrams is sort of the upper limit. So very small amount of tissues needed. So these um, molecular amplification tests, um, too much sample can actually overload it. So if you have too much genetic material in a, in a reaction, a PCR reaction or a lamp reaction, it'll actually cause it to fail, especially um, in plants. There's a lot of junk um, cell walls. So plant material is more challenging than, than humans or animal material to extract RNA from because of the cell wall. It's a complex mixture of pectins and carbohydrates and lignin, and, and that goop can really interfere with PCR and uh, other methods of nucleic acid amplification. So um, the sample size is better if it's in that smaller range. Uh, so yeah, we need very little amount of root and we want it, you know, if, if you can take it from the, the periphery of the plant and just be as least invasive as possible, um, that's great. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, if you're able to take samples from around the, the pot, um, you can get a better sort of representative sample. Um, so you can take like a centimeter from around the pot. Um, the maximum we would suggest is, is maybe five centimeters of thin roots. Um, and then beyond that, if it's beyond that, um, it can cause a, a reaction to fail. So we don't like to, but if we have to, we have to pull some of the sample out, um, but preferably not because we like to keep everything in one tube. Uh, that, that was my next question was if we send you too much in a sample, you, you will adjust it appropriately for a better result. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll flag it. I mean, if it's a, you know, it's, it's really, really a headache to have to adjust the sample volume um, okay. because we have to do it in a, in a controlled fashion that I don't, you know, I, I can't risk it contaminating anything else. So I have to take it to a separate bench and it's a lot longer. Um, so our turnaround time. So when we receive samples, we can turn around results to you within 24 to 48 hours during business days. Um, but that timeline can get really thrown off if I have to adjust samples. Uh, and so it's, you know, one time I can do it, but it's, it's not something that I would repeat. You know, I would basically just say, I'll send you new test kits uh, and you'll have to send new samples because it's um, it really throws a monkey wrench into the works to have samples that are too large. Uh, and it doesn't help. It really doesn't. Um, the larger the sample, like I said, it can cause failure in the, in the reaction. Um, and if that were to happen, I can then dilute the sample and try again. But um, the small, yeah, I mean, we're talking a small sample of, of, of a centimeter is, is millions of cells. And each one of those cells presumably has millions of copies of the viroid. Um, these are really, really, really sensitive methods. So if it's in the sample, we will find it. Um, the sampling from around the plant is more, if it's a newer infection and it's more present in one side of the roots, you know, if you have a, uh, plants that are, are sharing or touching at all, then perhaps one side may have a, a viral load in it. But I've tried pooling samples and I usually don't see an increase in sensitivity. Um, 
you're not, I, I don't miss results because of that. I miss it more from biological reasons. Um, so if it's not in the sample yet, that's why we recommend multiple tests spaced, you know, three weeks apart. Um, that's a better way to go than pooling samples. Um, because comparing, so we did a, when we did the full study of all testing, all the different root types, uh, I also compared pooling versus single samples and the increase percent of positives, it, I didn't find any, uh, I think maybe one out of hundreds, there is a pooled sample that tested positive um, that missed, maybe a single sample would have missed. So it's um, it's more one of those things I suggest if people are really worried and they want to send, you know, a representative sample, that's great. But um, you're not going to, if you just send a single sample, you're not going to miss it really either. Um, so more important is multiple tests spaced out over time. That's more important than a pooled sample. Great. And I'm, you had mentioned mother plants and fresh clones. Um, I'm looking at a slide here. I, I, I screenshot a few slides from the uh, presentation from the webinar, so I would have notes to go off of with you here. And uh, one of the first slides in the presentation says symptoms on mother plants with the note being that most mother plants are asymptomatic. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So the, oh man, this viroid is just such a pain in the neck because um, oftentimes it will be asymptomatic. Um, and the reasons we don't have an exact trigger for why symptoms sometimes manifest. So why disease is happening? Uh, that is an area that Dr. Punja is actively researching as to why there's a, a, a trigger between latent symptoms, so asymptomatic and a disease dudded plant. Um, the Some of the possibilities would be changes in photo period might trigger uh, a proliferation of the viroid. Environmental stresses might trigger a proliferation in the viroid. So most facilities are, you know, I mean, the growers have been growing for a long time. They're really great at grows. And so their plants are super healthy. That may have some reasons as why it's asymptomatic a lot of the times is that the plants are super healthy and so they're not manifesting symptoms. Um, but until we know what that trigger is, I can't say for sure why some are diseased or not, but there does appear to be a combination of genotype and environmental conditions that when together um, can cause a manifestation of dudding, uh, loss of potency, morphological changes, you know, stunting, all those. Uh, it does appear that environment plus genotype play a role. So some genotype types may be more susceptible to that trigger, that switch, um, which stands to reason, especially if it, if it does end up being a photo period response, obviously different cultivars have different, you know, different genotypes have different responses to flowering and, and photo period. So, um, yeah, we're still trying to find more answers on that. Um, but it is certainly most, a lot of the time there are a lot of asymptomatic infections. Um, so. and that was sort of an eye-opening moment when we were doing these um, early studies with large-scale facilities and we're like, oh, wow, there's a lot more here than we realized. Yeah. And anecdotally, I would say from the facilities that we work with that have done testing that have um, known infections and because a lot of our guys are running living soil in bed. So they're reusing the soil, which creates more challenges around this viroid for sure. Um, if they're able to have a really uh, good run where they don't have a lot of uh, abiotic stresses, um, you know, just healthy plants that they're able to keep happy, they don't see it really express itself as much. Um, and, and so that would fit sort of with what you're saying. Um, I, I guess my question around that is, so, so if we have, say, a positive infection and we have a plant um, in a room that we know is infected, um, what are the chances then that the, we can't assume that the rest of the plants in the room are clean because they're not expressing? Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's no different than any other, you know, viral outbreak where if you think there's been close contact, um, those plants have to sort of go into a quarantine mode where you're yeah, you have to, you, the only way to know is molecular testing, especially when it's asymptomatic, but even with symptoms expressing to rule out, you know, any other cause, um, molecular testing is the only way. I mean, there's no way to walk into a facility, look at a plant and say that's for sure, without a doubt, 
you know, hoplite and viroid. The only way to know is testing. But yeah, in that situation where you have a positive plant and you have other plants that are really you know, anywhere in that room facility out, you know, grow just in general, um, maybe they, they were cloned, same cutting table, something like that. Um, any kind of, you know, you have to contact trace essentially. Um, and from there, the only way to know is, is, is testing. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's pernicious. I mean, it's, and it's a very stable viroid too. So it actually can last on surfaces for weeks. Uh, and that's another area of study that, that Dr. Kunja has been, been working on is just how stable is this thing. And that's not uncommon for viroids. Um, they are, just by their nature, they're these small, RNAs that form, it's a single stranded circular RNA, but it forms a complex where it binds with itself. And it, it basically is this really tight organization that it's really hard to degrade, um, both by just all the normal things that degrade viruses and, and DNA in general and RNA in general. Um, it is really stable. It's surprisingly stable. So that's the unfortunate reality of, of viroids. Yeah. So let's touch on that a little bit. Um, you, some of the recent research shows that heat is not a treatment option with this viroid. From what I understand. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like really high heat. Um, so, so, okay. So we're still working through that on hop latent viroids specifically. So a lot of, you know, what I, I look to when I get sort of rough numbers is, is something like potato spindle tuber viroid, sorry, potato tuber spindle viroid. I always get those two mixed up. Um, the, the word. So PTSVD. Um, that is one of the well-known viroids that has had a lot of studies on. It was, I think, the first one that was identified back in the 80s, but it wasn't until molecular te genetics techniques caught up that they were able to detect what a viroid actually was. Uh, so viroids in general, um, we're finding more now that we have more genetics tools to find them. But that viroid, potato tuber spindle viroid, they have shown, they have excreate, like really, really high resolution electron micrographs, um, so microscopes that can see at that level. Um, when you heat up the viroid, that tight structure it forms, it does start to pop back into a circle at around 70 Celsius. Um, so there's some opportunities to make it more susceptible to degradation at really high heat. Um, but to actually just degrade it, just just bar none, it's done. It's not lo no longer infectious. Yeah, heat is not looking to be super applicable, um, unfortunately. So, uh, just for those that said, I mean, like, you know, at certain, yeah, certain temperatures, it can start to lose its form. But for those of us stuck with an imperial system, um, 70 Celsius converts to 158 degrees Fahrenheit, oh, which thank is you. really yes. tough temperature yeah. to reach in a lot of grow rooms. Um, safely and with HVAC it's, equipment. So yeah. I just want to throw that yeah, out. Yeah, it's more <laughs> it's more applicable to like recirculating water systems where you could heat that water up to a really, really high temperature. But even then, some of it still might get through um, because it's not it's maybe it's losing its structure temporarily, but then when it cools back down, it yeah. So this was more of a when we were thinking about that with some of this testing, um, it was more directed towards recirculating water and how you can sterilize it coming back through. Um, and it's yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge. So other other options are uh, twenty percent bleach. I'm I'm looking at the notes here. Um, twenty percent yeah. bleach, Vercon. Um, how well do you oxidizers work? Um, like hydrogen peroxide right. based products. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, again, working through this stuff, and 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 Dr. Punja has more probably hop latent specific information that he's going to release when he's ready. Um, but in general, what I can tell you is is he knows that Vercon S, so two percent Vercon S is the most effective, um, and that tracks with other viroids. Um, so two percent Vercon S is the most effective. Next up would probably be ten percent bleach for three to five minutes, but. You know, obviously bleach stinks and it corrodes your 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 uh, pruning tools. So I recommend bleach because it's just something that everybody knows and it's common. Um, and that's typically, you know, it's pretty standard to use bleach, uh, 10% at least. Now you said 20. So um, if that's, you know, Dr. Prunja's recommendation, then yeah, it might it might take 20% to really be effective. Um, so those are the top two. 2% 2 work on S uh, and then 10% bleach. Then the... Uh, sort of hydrogen peroxide based and, and ethanol based and alcohol based stuff. 
Typically, those are less effective for vi- or less effective for viroids. So again, going back to potato tuber spindle viroid, they didn't find that those to be particularly effective. Um, and so I, I think that would probably track with hoplate. Structurally, all the viroids have a similar structure. They don't make proteins. They don't have a protein coat. They're just naked RNA that forms a little, you know, a circular structure that forms a little uh, uh, complementary sequence that has you know bumps in it. But um, structurally, they're all very similar. So I think that the effect of you know the e- efficacy of, of, of some of those uh, oxidizers and 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 hydro- hydrogen peroxide based you know sanidate kind of things. Uh, the ethanol-based ones, the, the efficacy is going to be lower than Burkhan S and bleach. Um, and that data will probably be out later this year um, from, from Dr. Punja's lab so that we can actually have like numbers on that. Um, one thing to mention just quickly <laughs> is bleach. Even if you, so, so in potato tuber spindle viral, if you bleach for 30 seconds, it's no longer infectious, um, but they were still able to detect it with, with PCR techniques from those swabs. Um, so it, it can make it no longer infectious, but on surfaces, you could still probably detect it. Um, but really all we care about is, is it infecting more plants? Right. So, um, so yeah, those would be the top two. Um, if you're using things like sanity and stuff, they may help, um, but they're not going to be hundred percent effective. And, and really, you know, I mean, some of these other ones like, like bleach probably isn't going to be hundred percent effective on sterilizing seeds either. You're probably going to get stuff come through. So how transmissible is this viroid with um, pruning tools, handling of plants, you know, onto clothing, yeah. things like that? Um, when I think of things as small, I just assume it's everywhere. Like, how do we? I know. Like, <laughs> how do we move through a facility <laughs> as safely as possible? Yeah. I guess is my question. Yeah, I know. When you can't see it, it starts to feel like it's everywhere. Um, not. Don't be too worried about it uh, as far as like gentle touching. So clothes and walking through facilities and handling of plants, the transmissibility is going to be low. Um, airborne, there's no evidence of it being airborne. Um, the main ones is sap contact. So if you have, if you're, if you're being rough with the plants and something breaks and, and there's, there's sort of that contact, that's highly transmissible, but just gentle touching, uh, things like that. If you're, if you're sterilizing your pruning tools, if you're switching pruning tools between cultivars or, or genotypes, um, that is low level of transmission. Uh, I think some of the, the, the main areas to focus on is just the infected clones from infected moms. So once a mom's infected, you should just assume all the clones are going to be infected. I've done some studies um, so as I had mentioned, the roots are the best place to test. So we found some, some, so in the very large scale study, we had six positive moms and we took a bunch of clones from those, uh, and we tested the cuttings of those clones and the cuttings came back negative. Mm-hmm. Now leaves and stems having less viroid. So then we rooted those and tested those for six months every month. Um, uh, and most of them did stay negative for those six months, but that doesn't necessarily mean they won't come back positive eventually. Um, but what I'm trying to get at here is that you can suppress, you know, if you, you can get clones from a mom that will appear negative at first, um, and then perhaps many months later, you can probably get a harvest through, um, and then maybe, you know, maybe the next generation of clones, it comes up positive again. So that's one of the main methods is just positive clone or, you know, clones from a positive mom. Um, the seeds, there is seed transmission. So, you know, I used to, when I was, when we were first sort of trying to figure out the transmissibility. We were looking at hops and hops. It's also seed transmissible, but levels are very low. And so it seemed like it might be a viable op- option to get away from it. But seed transmission in cannabis is somewhere between five to 30%. Um, so that's a big, you know, that's still an issue. Um, and then, yeah, the infected sap on contaminated pruning tools is, is another one. So if you're cut, if you're doing trimming, if you're doing active work with those tools, you got to sterilize between preferably if you had a separate set, you know, that'd be great. And then you could sterilize sort of longer instead of just a dunk and then move to the next plant. Um, But just sort of the gentle touching is not a big deal. Uh, The other main transmissible way is, um, you know, like I said, the the water transmission. So if they're sharing the same table and those roots are in the same sort of uh, medium, nutrient medium, um, that is definitely a way that that you can have uh, transmission. Um, And then I guess, 
really an area that should be very sterile is your cloning tables and benches, like wherever you're working on those clones. Um, if you have infected clones from an infected mom and you're doing work on that bench, that whole surface could be a potential mm. place that you could transmit to another another set of clones. So that's an area just to be really careful of is um, is cracks between tables that you're working on for anything where you're cutting plants. So if I'm understanding correctly, I could buy seeds or, or get seeds in to my facility, pop those seeds. They could look, the, the mother plant could look clean, that plant, those seeds could look clean. And then the second cycle, I could make it all the way through flower. And then if I clone off that plant down the road, I could still get uh, hop latent viroid potentially. Uh, yeah. So, okay. That's a tough one. We're still working on. I mean, the, the long-term, those really long-term projects are difficult because you have to have sterility, like really, really tight sterility in a lab facility yeah. for a long period of time to get like, this came from this seed without a doubt. There was no horizontal transmission from anywhere else. So those studies are challenging. What I can tell you is that seed transmission is, is, is possible. So five to 30%, we are getting transmission through seeds. You can try and surface sterilize, but um, it's likely transmitted via, um, so in hops, it's transmitted via pollen. Uh, we don't know yet for, for cannabis if it's just pollen or if it's pollen and egg cells, but it's in the seed, um, presumably. We're still working on those tests. So the as far as the detection, so if you take that seed, you bring them into your facility, you pop them, you grow them, definitely should be testing those, those, um, those plants I would prefer they're at least a month old. Um, that's another area where there might be, we might be missing things when they're in that young seedling stage. Um, it seems like the hop latent can basically hide from detection. Like we've sampled a bunch of seedlings and that specific stage of development in the plant, it, it seems to be able to suppress the viroid and it's not until it's older. So then really pivotal would be if you're cloning, you know, once you have a mom and you're ready to make the next generation of moms from that, that's a really pivotal place to test. Those roots of that mom, I would expect to show, I would expect to see the hot latent at that point. Um, whether or not, you know, it would show up in the next generation. Um, I don't have the data to say that that's happening. I just would caution people against thinking that they're in the clear as soon as they've tested that mom it's clean and now they never need a test again um it's just okay i, I think that that's setting yourself up for for heartbreak later if you if, if um if stuff starts coming back positive you know in a generation or two um it's a completely different system but lettuce chlorosis virus in cannabis uh sometimes the symptoms don't manifest until the next generation off that mom and that's in a peer-reviewed publication where they saw more severe symptoms in the following generation. So the verdict's still out on hop latent as far as does it get more severe, you know, the more generations you go. Um, all we can do at this point is test them when they're old enough to test. So for me, that's about a month to two months old. So that teenage stage before you up pot to mom plants, it's a great place to test them. And then test before, you, you know, a week before you clone that mom, uh, test the roots then. Those are sort of the two benchmark places that that um working with with growers that sort of seems to be a good place to check um to see you know at the very least you'll know that that next generation should be clean yeah you gave us some numbers and uh, i'm also looking at another slide from dr punja's presentation on some work mm -hmm. with Tumi genomics that showed uh yep. positive females crossed with a negative male meaning the 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 females had hop latent the, the male did not, and the infection rate was 31 out of 71 seedlings, which is about 43, 44% infection rate um, that varied from mother to mother from 23 to 53% um, with the viroid present on the seed coat and inside the seed itself. So pretty high transmission rate, unfortunately. Um, and yours was a little bit lower, yeah. but still a, a fairly high rate of transmission. So I, I think that's something that growers yeah. should be aware um, of. Right. I think that's teasing apart two things. I mean, because the, the seed coat, that's, yeah. So when I was seeing, talking about transmission, we're talking about sort of inside the seed, mm. the actual seed. So if you sterilize the seed coat, hopefully you wouldn't get that transmission. But um, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty high for seed. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're, this would be a reason to sterilize the outside of the seed coat as a way of reducing yeah, absolutely. viral Yeah, load. absolutely. The, the seeds, 
Right. Yeah. Seeds before you um, before you pop those seeds, uh, 10% bleach, three to five minutes to try and sterilize anything that's on the seed coat. Um, it may still. I mean that can't be 100%, you can't be certain that that's 100% effective getting everything off the seed coat, but that should, at the very least, lower that that transmission rate um, from just things that are residual from the mom plant, um, just on the seed coat. So that brings up another topic um, that I wanted, I wanted to discuss with you. So this idea of viral load, I know that just from everything we've been learning mm-hmm. with COVID and how viruses work. I know with this particular viroid, if we're able to lower the, the load, the amount of viroid present, is there any research to show that the effects on the plant may be lower with a lower viral viroid load than, you know, another plant, for example? Because <clears throat> to say a plant's infected, it doesn't re- really speak to what level of infection we have, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the level of infection definitely would correlate with, um, typically correlates with symptoms of disease. Um, So yeah, higher viral loads. So, okay, so this goes back to sort of that genotype environment thing. um, And that's sort of where we're trying to learn more about various genotypes. Are they more susceptible to higher loads of virus uh, or viroid? Um, And the environment, what triggers cause that proliferation of the viroid? Um, the more that's present, the more likely you're going to get symptoms. Uh, so there's basically the way that this is likely affecting the plant is the sequence of the viroid is matching a sequence of genes that are being turned on in the plant. And when those two things match, it can get car- it targeted for degradation. So it's basically turning off genes. Um, so the more the viroid is present, the more likely it is to turn off some of those genes that result in some of those symptoms of, of stunting and, and reduced potency and flowering. So, uh, yeah, viral load should correlate with disease symptoms. But as far as what kind of data we have, um, it's somewhat, somewhat limited. Um, the way that we do our testing, it's not going to be fully quantitative. So to get quantitative results, you have to purify, like highly purify the RNA. um, And then you have to quantify the RNA. All those things cost money, making it not really affordable for just the typical grower to quantify. And honestly, if you have the viroid, you have the viroid. And if it's low, high, um, it doesn't really matter as far as what your next steps are going to be of getting rid of the viroid. Um, So the quantification of some of these things, I've, I've sort of left that. Uh, that's more in the academic side of things rather than um, robust, you know, testing methods for, for clients. Um, so, yeah, as far as the quantity of the viroid, it will correlate with disease symptoms. Yeah, I think of it more of how of of viral load management or, or viroid management, because in a lot of these facilities that we work with, um, mm it doesn't necessarily feel realistic to try and completely eradicate it or if that's even possible, um, especially because a lot of the, the growers that we work with are reusing their media, which um, adds a whole mm-hmm. other layer of, of challenges. So like, for example, at right. Mako Farms, they, um, they're growing in these, these soil beds that are not leaving the flowering room. So if we know it's in that in that flowering room, in that soil, in that media, um, that, it, it's it's not going anywhere, I guess. And so it's more about yeah. management at that point, unless they want to, you know, replace yeah. all the soil or or do something like that. But that's you know, for a lot of growers, that may not be realistic or, or practical from financially. Um, so that led me to what sort of cultural practices can we adopt? to reduce viral loads, such things as removing as much root mass when we go to harvest as possible versus leaving that root mass in, would that potentially reduce the amount of viroid present in that media? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, you're right. When you're using living soil and you're, you're, you want that, those nutrients back in the soil, um, most certainly, the more we learn about management practices, certain, you know, genotypes that may be more resistant to actually seeing the, pheno, you know, the, the, the disease symptoms, um, the more we learn about environmental triggers, those are obviously going to be really important for those grows. As far as trying to maintain 
the same media, the same soils. I would agree with you that removing root mass is probably one of the best steps you can take because the more root mass is there, the more viroid that's going to be there. Um, so yeah, that is one very you know practical step that you could take. Um, it's unfortunate because obviously you'd like to keep sort of some of that in the media. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really all you can do, right? So um, as far as those kind of management practices, removing the infected material is, is probably the best you can do. Uh, and then from there, you know, I mean, there's not, as far as suppressing actual transmission, suppressing actual proliferation, there's nothing that I know of at this moment that could prevent, you know, the transmission to a new round of plants in that media. Um, and going back, you know, the heat treatment is not applicable. So it's it, at this point, I don't know how else you would be able to sterilize that media or just prevent infection. So as far as management practices, I think, yeah, maybe the only practical thing you can do is remove some of that root mass after that, that those plants are harvested. Um, and then starting with clean genetics, you know, when you when you reset, if, you know, if you can, if you're able to reset and just starting with things that are clean, um, as far as natural transmission, uh, we're still working on some of those methods, you know, I mean, so presumably uh, insects that have piercing and sucking mouth parts, you know, thrips um, and uh, aphids potentially could spread hop latent, but where they would get that from, if you have a, you know, if you have a farm that's all clean stock, um, that is still an unknown, right? So um, where hop latent viroid may be introduced naturally or, or outside um, is still not something we have data on. So if you started with a, you know, if you're doing living soil, you start with clean stock, start with clean media, and then you'll be, hopefully, you'll be safe for a while um, because I don't know of how else you'd introduce it into your crop. So that's... Well, let's just say we know you we know, get it prevented. in a facility. So I know I keep throwing my buddy yeah. Justin under the bus in this podcast, <laughs> but he's been the best case for us of working through this. So um, if we know we have clean stock because we yep. tested um, and we know we have clean mothers... We know we have an infected flower room where those beds have media that had active, you know, had viroid in there. Um, that would be a great way to reduce viral load on the plants themselves. So knowing they're coming in clean, they're yep. only going to have 55 yep. days of exposure to this viroid and potentially yep. uh, less of an impact on our final crop, I guess, is where I'm headed with this. Correct. Yeah, correct. Um yeah. And so going back to a previous study that we had done where we took cuttings off of, of, a, of a positive mom and those cuttings stayed positive for six months. Um, and then I think only one or two came back positive later after that. Uh, yes. So if you go in with clean stock, it'll stay clean for those that, that harvest, that 55 day harvest. I Maybe, maybe some get infected, but it, it would be minimal um, as far as what I've seen. So yeah, if you're going in with clean stock, even if it's going into that infected soil, while they may get infected, they may not show symptoms. Uh, and that viral load is correlated with that. So okay. uh, as far as management practices, if you're able to, yeah, if that's if that's a practical solution for you, yes, that, that would help reduce the viral load and subsequent symptoms and bad harvest. But we would want to be careful then when we're harvesting not to go back through any vegetative spaces or have any contact with vegetative plants um, just to reduce that potentially circling around, right? Or is that not yeah, a huge I mean, risk okay. in your in your eyes? Well, okay, so if you're, I just need to make sure I understand the question correctly. Um, so if you're planning on making a new generation of plants from that set? No, so is that plants coming into the flower room are clean, we go to, but once yeah. they're in the flower room, let's say they're now infected or dirty, um, we wanna make sure that that harvest is going out a separate way not coming back oh, through yeah. our, our, our veg space, um, or our cloning Absolutely. space. Yeah. Um, and so just yeah. people should have SOPs around that, making sure that we're keeping things as clean as possible. And that would be good for any viroid or pathogen or yeah. pest in general, um, just as best, right. best practice. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, so keeping that chain um, moving one direction, um, even with cured dried flour, uh, yeah, it should not, ever come back um, to those earlier stages of, of, of growth. So one thing we haven't really talked about in this podcast, I know we've covered it in prior podcasts and most people are aware of this, but we probably should just go over, you know, what some of the more common symptoms are with uh, hop latent viroid 
Um, do you want to start it off? And I can add on anything that, because <laughs> there's a lot. It is a lot. Um, so the loose buds, okay, so we'll start with flower because um, that's really, you know, I mean, that's the, sort of one of the hallmarks uh, is the dudding. So if you don't have flower at all, I mean, that's the worst case scenario, but then loose flower. Uh, so often it's called like larfy buds. So um, not nice, tight, not nice, tight flowers, um, smaller yields. Often, you, you, I mean, there are, so I think Dr. Punja has found that that, that apical branch, sometimes I have smaller buds and sometimes the secondary branches will have one that looks more normal. Um, if it affects the plant earlier and you get full on stunting, then the plant, that apical branch will start to, to you know, basically slow growth and the side branches will come up. So you get sort of a trident looking plant uh, or a candelabra. Um, so lots of lateral growth. Uh, brittle stems. So if you just walk by and hit one and it just flops off the plant, that's a really serious symptom. So that's that's a hallmark of, of hop latent. Um, there's some correlation with leaf morphology. So we are seeing some interesting leaf phenotypes that I had not previously known as associated with uh, hop latent. Um, some people have yellow yellow leaves towards the crown. Um, and then the main one is your, your COAs. So that way, if you have asymptomatic plants, but your COAs are dropping, you know, harvest by harvest, and that can also be a sign that something's going on uh, regarding hop latent. So the potency, um, the reduction in potency, it, it can be severe, you know, it can be like 50% or more. Um, so those kind of things are all hallmarks. Um, some anecdotal ones, some poor rooting. So in clones, uh, if you're getting really poor rooting, that can actually be a symptom um, that we've noticed, uh, given where we're finding the viroid, that's not really too surprising. So some of that can actually be seen early in, in when you're rooting clones. And so those would be probably the main ones um, that come to mind. I, you got all the ones that I had from the presentation I was going to add to it, but I think you nailed them all. Uh, <laughs> the one other thing would be that uh, you may also have increased susceptibility if you have a hop blatant positive plant to other pathogens go ahead <laughs> yeah yeah so this is this is um so as i mentioned um, dr punja has been in this field for a long you know and in the field of cannabis and hemp and, and lots of other pathogens uh, mind you but um and, and different crops too but um specific to his research in, in cannabis and hemp um fungal pathogens uh he is just a worldwide expert on that um and what he has found is that there is an increased susceptibility to things like fusarium um and other root pathogens uh, when you have a hot plate environment infection. Um, so it sort of can spiral out of control, right? So, and this is pretty sort of a general rule that when the plants are diseased with one thing, it kind of leaves them susceptible to other diseases. Um, and that's just sort of, you know, it can only fight so many things at once. Um, and I, <laughs> I hate to bring this into it, but there is some evidence, and I, we don't have this in cannabis yet, but there is some evidence that these viroids, um, specifically hop stunt viroid and a few other viroids, can actually replicate in some fungi, so like fusarium, um, and then they can actually horizontally transmit. But we don't have that as evidence for cannabis yet, so I, I really want to make sure that big disclaimer is there. Um, mm -hmm. But there is some very interesting research going on. Uh, so right now there's 33 viroid species out in the world that we know of. I think three of them have been shown to have horizontal transmission with various fungi. Um, we don't have any data for hop latent on that yet, but um, it is an interesting sort of, you know, natural transmission possibility um, that that uh, these things could actually be replicated uh, in a fungi and just kept alive in a fungi and then, you know, be transmitted horizontally that way, which would be not fun, not a fun way. So. So I'm sure there's going to be more research coming out um, mm. sooner than later because this is such a devastating uh, devastating disease. And I do hope to get Dr. Punja on the show eventually. He's just yeah. been really busy. Um, but I know, yeah. I know you're in contact <laughs> yeah. with him and, and you did a virtual introduction for me, which I appreciate. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, um, while we're, you know, until we get more research, I feel like you covered that all pretty well. What other viruses are you really seeing or other pathogens as being more prevalent in your lab with the testing that you're doing in cannabis specifically? Yeah, yeah I mean, so 
we do really broad range pathogen detection as far as viruses are concerned. So the things that affect a lot of crops, you know, the mosaics like alfalfa and cucumber mosaic and, and, and tomato mosaic, those aren't that common. We find those very rarely. Um, they can infect cannabis, but typically I only recommend those on a case by case basis. Um, the main ones that are more more prevalent would be beet curly top virus. Now that's more outdoor grows. Um, so Dr. Punya Nachapa at Colorado State University, really great research on beet curly top virus. Um, the Southwest is where the natural transmission vector overwinters. So um, that's beet leaf hoppers. They typically they're, they overwinter in like New Mexico and then they travel um, up into Colorado. So that's outdoor grows really susceptible to beet curly top. I have seen it as far I have seen it in Washington, um, and that's not unusual. Uh, beet, you know, sugar beets are affected by beet curly top in Washington and Oregon. So um, that is a possibility. So beet curly top, the symptoms, there's three different strains of beet curly top and it can range in severity. Um, so the symptoms can be a little different depending on what type of strain you got. The one that I saw was really twisted growth, um, swollen leaf veins and the leaf pulls down like there's a drawstring in it um, and the, the, the branches curl. So the symptoms can be really stark on that one. Um, and it may only affect one part of the plant. So this plant, it was like one branch was all curled and then everything else was fine. But um, you can detect mm -hmm. bee curly top anywhere in that. Um, so that one is one to, to watch out for. And I mean, that one, I don't think, um, the data so far says it's not me mechanically transmitted. Uh, it's a DNA-based plant virus, which is the smaller, most plant viruses are RNA-based. DNA-based plant viruses only account for about 25%. Um, and I think think that its life cycle needs, it, it doesn't uh, mechanically transfer well. So um, that one's not as big of a, you know, a spread problem. Um, but outdoor grows, yeah, should be worried about that. Lettuce chlorosis virus is another one. Uh, originally, lettuce chlorosis virus was identified in lettuce in California, um, but it was found in cannabis facility in a really well done peer reviewed article, uh, I think in 2017 or 2019 from, uh, I believe it was Israel. But yeah, they um, have symptoms of you know, chlorosis, so yellow plants um, reduce the yield, stunting. Typical with most viruses, stunting is kind of a, a common theme, weird morphology things. So those would be the two that I think a lot of people look to test for is B. curly top lettuce chlorosis virus. Um, so far, no symptoms have been correlated with tobacco mosaic virus, even though people, you know, you might go on online forums and people might suggest that it can infect cannabis, but the peer-reviewed articles, and it's an old one, admittedly, um, but the studies where they've infected cannabis, there's no symptoms for tobacco mosaic. Uh, cannabis cryptic virus, the name implies that it actually doesn't do anything. So cryptic, we give that to viruses that it's there, but it doesn't actually cause symptoms. Hmm. So people might tell you cannabis cryptic is an issue. We can test for it. Currently, there's no strong correlation with that and symptoms. Um, and there is a really good also peer reviewed article on cannabis cryptic virus done, I want to say 2019, 2020, um, where they sort of, they were trying to figure out the cause of, uh, what appeared to be hemp streak, I think it was, or hemp mosaic, it was either hemp streak or hemp mosaic. So hemp streak virus and hemp mosaic virus, those aren't actually, we don't know what those are. Those are just symptoms that have been seen on plants that have been then given a disease name, but no one's ever figured out what the disease is. Like no one's figured out the cause for those. So they went looking for the cause of hemp street. All they found was cannabis cryptic virus and it didn't correlate. Like every time they, it didn't correlate with symptoms. Sometimes they would see it with symptoms, sometimes without. And so as we know it now, cannabis cryptic doesn't cause symptoms. It's not to say that we won't find some correlation later, maybe with specific genotypes or something. Um, but that's one we can test for. But so far, no symptoms from that. So the ones that are really, you know, it's hop latent, far and away. Beet curly top, if you have symptoms that are reminiscent. Lettuce chlorosis, um, those would be the main ones. Then there's one more that I don't want to get too far ahead, and I don't want to. I don't want to be alarmist. Um, it's cannabis mitovirus one. I've been finding it. I've been testing a lot of samples in the background um, just as a sort of a figure out. It's really prevalent, really, really prevalent. Um, we're talking on the scale of, you know, it's probably similar prevalence just to something as like hop latent viroid. 
But again, this is one that we don't think at this moment, there's no evidence to say it causes symptoms. So a cannabis mitovirus, it's a virus that proliferates in the mitochondria. Um, mitoviruses in general are sort of an emerging research area. Uh, I think a lot of the research, this is one of those things that we started finding now that we have all these next gen sequencing technologies and we're able to assemble these tiny genomes um, from scratch and we've been finding more of them. So the research is very early and not just cannabis, like all mitoviruses, the research is pretty early. The only one that has any sort of empirical data is uh, one that affects quinoa plants. They don't find symptoms, but they, they have found a correlation with increased immune response. So the plants are more ready to, to, to um, fight off other infections because it primes the immune response. So that's a lot of info. Um, Cannabis mitovirus is probably prevalent in a lot of cannabis crops, but as of now, we don't think it causes issues. Maybe that changes. Maybe we correlate some symptom with it. As of now, it's not something I'm like going out there and telling people, oh, they got to test for. Um, so that's sort of the lay of the land. Uh, the generic viruses are less common. Um, and then, yeah, it's hop laden far and away is the one you need to be worried about. Be curly top for outdoor grows, lettuce, chlorosis intermittently. Um, and then, um, the cannabis mitovirus one, but that's not something you need to test for. It's just probably there. Dr. Punja gave some prevalence numbers, in he terms did, yeah. of, but I, I don't want to misspeak because I don't, I didn't write that down. Do you he's remember seeing it? Yeah. So he's seen it around 90% of the samples he's looked at have cannabis mitovirus. I'm seeing more two thirds ish, oh. but these are probably differences in sampling at this time. Um, I, I was thinking for hot laden. Sort of, sorry. Oh, hot laden, uh, prevalence. Um, yeah. So that one, the numbers are, so I sort of think of facilities because once a facility is infected, it's sort of, you got to make sure that your facility is clean and it's not spreading. So facilities, we're seeing it in like 90% of facilities. And uh, I can't remember what Dr. Punja's numbers are on this. So that one, I don't want to, I don't want to say off the cuff. Um, the prevalence is, yeah, for us, we're seeing it in like 90% of facilities. And, and the ones that we're not seeing it in, sometimes it might just be because they're not sampling enough. Like it's a few plants here um, and it's not sort of a robust testing strategy. So it's highly prevalent. Um but as far as the number on cultivars, I don't have that off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't remember so either. Really I remember he threw out like the num the percentage in Canada that was infected and it was that he suspected was infected. And it was I remember it was over 50 percent because I was shocked by it. Um, yeah. How high? Over? Yeah. I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head. So I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to misspeak, but um, it, yeah. it appears to be and that, and everywhere. And that's, see, that's why I like to think of it as facilities because yeah, it, it is everywhere one, but two, it's like, um, if you were to say, okay, 50% of cultivars in Canada have it or, or America or whatever, um, how many facilities is that? Because it, once it's in a facility, it can be transmit to all, you know, it can be transmit to your cultivars, um, very quickly if you don't have good protocols in place. Um, so that's why the numbers can be a little bit, yeah, so, so it's, um, it is a very large number though. It is, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that tracks of over 50 tracks, um, because once it's in a facility, it's usually widespread, um, especially considering the data on how it spreads is only just now sort of getting ironed out. Um, so folks may have been unwittingly knowing, you know, transmitting it, the seed, bringing in seed, thinking it's clean, uh, things like that. So yeah, those numbers, yeah, it's probably greater than 50% of plants. So one thing I wanted to just go back to was you mentioned um, with the hemp or, or cannabis, like the leaf, the streaking, you don't know what causes that. Is yeah. that at all related to variegation or is the, are those two totally separate things? Uh, or do you know? Probably separate things. Yeah, probably separate things, um, but I don't know. Um, so hemp streak virus and hemp uh, mosaic virus are things that have been around decades. Um, people have just sort of called it that without, it basically manifests like something that looks like a virus. Um, hemp streak has Chevron like, um, uh, check marks on the leaves. And that's typical of something like the streak viruses. That's a name we give to ones that have sort of a Chevron shaped streak in there, you know, in the main host. So tobacco streak virus in tobacco, gives a little Chevron streak on the, on the leaves. Mm. Um, 
and the mosaic typical mosaic symptoms if you've seen if you've you looked at you know uh, online forums with people who say they may have to tobacco mosaic virus that's a mosaic symptom and you can see it so those are very clear um, sort of morphologies that that were associated with hemp streak and hemp mosaic now we don't know what causes those whether or not that's um, actually viral or, or we don't we just don't know um, and it could be one of these other viruses um, but back then they didn't have the techniques to, to test um, and so sort of just gave it a name um, as far as variegation goes uh, there could be things that look similar to a mosaic based on a variegation, like sort of a, a somatic mutation that then is looks like that. But variegation, when I think of it, it's sort of like, you know, if somebody sends me a, a, a leaf that's like half white and half green, like mm -hmm. that's a really clear sort of variegated leaf. And that's not, that's just typical sort of mutation that happens uh, over, you know, thousands of thousands of plants. You're going to get a plant that may have that kind of split pattern. So that's not um, correlated then with any particular virus or viroid that you're no. aware of or no that's no. just the normal genetic mutation. no yeah okay. yeah it's just a normal genetic thing if you were to clone off that you might actually get clones that look variegated it's it's probably just a, a somatic mutation which means like a, a a cell that's not a reproductive cell that has a mutation so okay. every so often these things are going to happen um the older things are you know the older we get the more somatic mutations we accumulate and eventually one of those may cause cancer kind of thing um, so yeah, this is just a normal process, especially when you're cloning and you're growing in these high growth situations. Um, eventually, yeah, there might be a, a leaf or, or even a plant that just, um, just doesn't look great. Um, and so that's one of those, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, it, so, it's not likely to be correlated with it. Okay. Pattern. Last, last question then, uh, since you brought it up, uh, the, uh, sort of like, uh, mutation over time with, with genetics. So people mm. talk about genetic drift with cloning. Um, I, I, I'm under the impression that's not really a thing. It's more about maybe you may get some small mutations that may manifest over time. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? And then this idea of moving a plant outdoors to sort of revitalize the genetics. Um, can you touch on both of those really quickly? Sure. Um, okay, so the... <laughs> So the first one is the na the word the phrase genetic drift is is been thrown out a lot and it's not in this particular context is not used correctly it's one of those so sorry so when I was in when I was in grad school I was teaching every single semester in first year genetics that was always a tough concept because it sounds um, it sounds like it, it has a, it sort of sounds like something like genetic drift. It's drifting away from something. Um, genetic drift actually refers to natural populations and random mating. Um, so by random chance, you may randomly drift towards one phenotype just by random chance. And that's genetic drift is, is sort of uh, in in um, natural populations where there's no uh, is not is non random. So it's, you got random mating and, and things like that. Like it, it meets all the criteria of a natural population. You may get a genetic drift one direction. Um, so, so that's not what we're dealing with with, with that clonal stuff. Could you um, touch on that? So like like let's just say let, let's let's give an example. Um, so if we had a population of gorillas and one gorilla had larger ears, they may, that pole population may drift towards having larger ears just based on random mating. Um, is that yeah. genetic drift then what you're saying? It's, it's not necessarily um, a mutation. It's just that one particular trait may yeah. become more prevalent over time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. So they, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very common one that's, um, yeah, on exams, that was always a fun one to grade. So, <laughs> so okay. I, I yeah, just want to make sure uh, I understood it. Okay. Yeah. 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 In, in a nutshell. Yes. Yes. Um, there's certain assumptions that are met out in the world that, um, yeah, that's where genetic drift is actually happening. So in these sort of artificial scenarios where we're, we're doing artificial mating and we're cloning and things like that, it's not applicable here. Um, but what we are talking about, is that a, is that you have a genetic, you have a genotype that had a reliable phenotype, and over time that phenotype is changing, right? So that's sort of what we're trying to to discuss um, when we talk when when people are talking about that in this context. So that is um, over time you may get mutations that accumulate within that plant, and when you clone off that plant, 
um, the next generation may have those slight variations, right? Um, so because it's because it's clonal, everything coming off that plant is going to be a genetically identical. And then from that, you know, subsequent generations, these things are going to start to, to snowball. You're going to get more and more of these somatic mutations. Uh, it only affects it if you take a clone off of that mutation. But if that mutation happened early in that next mom's development, but every all those cells that grow from it are going to have that mutation. So the longer you go, the more likely that's going to happen. The longer I live, the more mutations I'm going to accumulate. Um, that's just the way it is, especially now the other, this part, the next part, the stickier part of that is that we, our DNA replication mechanisms get worse over time. So it introduces more mutations. Um, with clonal plants, I don't have, I don't actually know the answer as to that, whether or not those replication me mechanisms start to get worse subsequent generations or not. I think that they would, well, I don't actually know the answer to that. So that's one of the issues is that if you have over time, if you have mm, mutations that are occurring in the replication, you know, the DNA, then you're going to get more and more muta mutations over time. It's going to be less able to proofread those errors. The error rate for different organisms, you know, it's like one in a trillion cells or, you know, it's, it's, it's rare because there's proofreading mechanisms in place, but it happens because we're dividing, you know, trillions of cells to make a plant, you know, lots of cells. So it happens. Um, so that's over time how you're accumulating these, these changes in genotype. The part about resetting outside also, I mean, I should probably preface it. This is all speculation on my part because I don't have the data to, 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 to go off of. Um, I've heard of this where you have a, a genetic that's no longer performing the way it used to. And so people put it outside to try and, and see if that resets some of what you used to love about that cultivar or genetic. Um, it's possible that something epigenetic, now these are modifications that are triggered by various environmental stimuli. It's possible that something like that could be reintroduced if you put it back outside. But I don't have any data to support that. Uh, so those are all anecdotal. I've heard people who take a plant that's underperforming, grow it outside for a generation, bring it, you know, back in or whatever, um, and it performs better. If you were to do that, I would recommend testing, like make sure that you're not putting something outside, getting a pathogen, bringing it back in. Um, mm -hmm. So be careful of that. You might want to quarantine it when it comes back in. Just make sure that there's nothing pathogenic that you brought back in from going outside. Um, but I wouldn't rule out that being a way. I don't. Yeah, I have no reason to suggest that that wouldn't help. You know, if people say it helps, maybe it does. I don't have any data on that. So um, there are some possible genetic mechanisms that could potentially be involved in something like that. So um, just so I understand what you're saying, you're saying yeah. it is, it's possible that by moving a plant outside, maybe exposure to sunlight, so something to do with photobiology, something to do with the microbiology interacting with the plant could potentially unlock something in those genetics that wasn't being unlocked indoors is that kind of a dumbing down yeah. way of saying what you're saying yeah i mean it's potentially i mean yeah so different you know i mean the light one i think is interesting because full spectrum light photo period changes those you know those i mean i know photo period changes do involve epigenetic there are some 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 um, non-heritable changes in in gene expression that happen uh boy is it complicated though so hmm. It's one of those issues that I, I, I just don't have, you know, the, the data, it, it's a complicated phenomenon to begin with, but then to try and, uh, and to try and um, say that I know one way or the other, I don't. Um, so if it works for people, it works. It's sort of where I'm at with it. Um, we do see, I will say this. Uh, so we, when we put a plant through tissue culture and it comes back out, oftentimes it is a much healthier version of what that genetic used to be. Um, and that could be a variety of reasons. It could be cleaning up, you know, just some un, unknown, you know, some some underlying pathogen or, or cause like that. It could be putting it into tissue culture, elicits some sort of epigenetic change, and it comes back out and it's healthier. Um, so, well, from my own personal experience, going through TC does help reset that. Um, people have said that that going outdoors and coming back, oh, it can help reset that. And I have no reason to say that that I have no evidence to say the contrary. So. Um, the exact mechanisms for why, uh, I, I don't know. Um, 
but it could have something to do with something like a non-heritable change like epigenetics, um, which are chemical modifications of, of the genome that make certain genes more or less likely to be turned on. Um, that's sort of epigenetics in a nutshell. Uh, there are some that are heritable, but most of them are not. Okay, for real, most that last, I know last question then, because <laughs> I had one more. Are there, are there any known cultivars or genotypes that are resistant to hoplate and viroid at this time? At this time, I do not have that, no. Um, There's data to show some think, level of resistance, right? I mean, yeah, across a variety yeah, and, of cultivars. <laughs> Right. And, there, and there's there's also uh, a recent, there's a white page by Medicinal Genomics uh, end of last year where they looked at the structure of hoplite and viroid. And I had mentioned earlier that the way that it causes symptoms or the way that we, the, the, the leading hypothesis for why it causes symptoms is that part of the genome is a match for genes in the cannabis genome. And when I say a match, it's sort of like the yin, it's, it, it's the, the, the mirror image. Um, and when those two things come together, they form a double-stranded RNA that can be degraded. So it can basically change gene expression. So what medicinal genomics then also looked for is, is cultivars that had a slightly different version of that, those genes so that it wasn't such a good match and so the, the disease wouldn't manifest as much. So now it's not resistant to infection. It still would be infected, but it would be more resistant to the adverse effects of infection. I think that for something like this, I think that's more likely uh, a path forward. The problem with viroids is they're so darn tiny that once they're in the plant and they start replicating, it, there's the challenge is how does the plant actually degrade it? Um, and there are some perhaps genetic engineering methods that you could do to basically have a plant ready to target that for degradation. But it's a, it's... I don't know if we're going to find something that's resistant to the infection. I think what we might find is something that's resistant to the symptoms of the infection. I think that's probably more likely. What have they done in the hops community to deal with hop latent viroid? That's a great question. Um, so up until recently, they didn't think that hop latent viroid caused any symptoms. I think recent studies have found that it decreases some of the aromatics, some of the, you know, just like we're seeing a decrease in, in the cannabinoids, THC and things like that. Um, I think recent studies have found decreases in those, those desirable chemical compounds of hop uh, cones. But previously, they hadn't really thought it was a big problem, so they weren't really doing a whole heck of a lot. Some mm -hmm. of the things they do um, to prevent uh, having so when you have the material lying around, you know, you got facilities full of hop cones and things like that, and binds, and when you destroy the binds, um, some of the things they're doing is uh, anaerobic digestion at high heat. Um, so this goes back to that: you know, how hot do you need to go to get viroid to get degradation? They did show degradation of hop lane viroid at seventy Celsius, but it took like days, uh, and that's also an anaerobic. Um, digestion. So they have enzymes in there that are, that are helping degrade some of that stuff. So um, what are they doing? Same things we're doing. It's more preventative than anything. Um, and getting rid of stocks that have viroid. So they have a different viroid. I think they're more concerned about hop stunt viroid. Um, and so that one has been shown to be transmitted by aphids, uh, goats, uh, a few other things. So, so the hop stunt viroid is probably their major concern. I think more now that they've learned more about the cone thing that maybe hop latent be more, uh, more prevalent, but yeah, testing clean stocks. Um, and I guess replacing whenever they have to, because those grow from rhizomes, right? So it's, you're, you're kind of having to dig those up and replace them whenever you have to. But, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really the same issues. I mean, viroids cannot be, there's nothing you can do to, there's no, there's no, there's no pesticide or, or, or spray you can use to, to get rid of a viroid um, as it stands now. Uh, and I don't expect there to be one just because of how these things operate, what they actually are. Um, unfortunately, the reality is clean stocks and preventative measures are your best tool against them. Great. Well, on that note, I really appreciate your time today. I learned a lot and I think that was really helpful to get that information out to growers. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Have a wonderful rest of your day.
Yeah, and if anybody's interested in um, virus testing, uh, my email is jack.muns at three rivers biotech. So that's three is in the number three rivers biotech. Um, and then we also do tissue culture uh, in, in various states um, and also in Canada. So um, if you're interested in cleaning up stocks, um, that's one way or storage. So yeah, if you have any questions, reach out and uh, I will answer as best I can. Thank you very much for the time today, Ted. Absolutely. All right. Have a great day. Bye. That was Dr. Jack Munns, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. We also have a Patreon where you can get insider access to the team at Kiss Organics through Hangouts, as well as earn some cool perks and benefits for supporting the podcast. Lastly, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.